Welcome to SaaS Unscripted, a podcast by Noble Recruitment. I'm your host, Nick van Eten, and in this podcast, we will take a look behind the scenes of the SaaS world. Join us on a growth journey through stories, challenges, and achievements of the people driving this industry forward. Get ready for SaaS Unscripted. Hey, welcome to another episode of SaaS Unscripted. Uh, this is the podcast where we interview people with a glamorous uh, career in SaaS. I'm very excited about this episode. Uh, Michael Smink, he has an incredible journey up to top biller of a global top biller of the SaaS company Chargebee. And uh, yeah, very excited for this one. Uh, can you please introduce yourself, uh, Michael? What what an intro, uh, Nick! <laughs> thanks for thanks for the invite. Really, really appreciate it. Was very much looking forward to this uh, to this session together with you. Uh, of course, not only because we're well, you helped me get into my first sales or SaaS role, but also because we're good friends. So thanks for the invite. Um, by means of the introduction, yeah, live in Amsterdam together with my wife, little daughter uh, Olivia, born twelve weeks ago. Um, and work at Chartree. I think that's that's good for now. Let's dive. Uh, let's dive in later. <laughs> and yeah, what I al- uh, also would like to discuss today is that um, yeah, you started your journey uh, in recruitment, and uh, yeah, I want to hear your learnings, what you took from that uh, to become a global uh, top biller in SaaS. Absolutely. Before we dive in, uh, I first want to start with the start. Can you tell me uh, more about your youth? How did you grow up? Uh, where did you go to school? What kind of hobbies did you have? Shall we uh, start with the start? Start with the start. Um, born in Huizen in het Gooi. And after, when I was like seven years old, we moved to the to the east part. Dutch people might know it, the Achterhoek. Nice and calm, together with my parents, no brothers and sisters. Eventually uh, decided to study hotel management. Uh, I, I, I thought I fell in love with the romantic idea of being the general manager of a beautiful five-star hotel. I was able to experiment a little bit with that during my internship in London, during the Olympics, which was, yeah, that was it was good fun. But it also made me realize that as a general manager of a hotel, it's rather operational instead of you making the strategic decisions. Um, so that's the that's the part where I eventually decided, like, well, maybe there is something else outside of this hotel world. Um, but yeah, with a bachelor in hotel management, you're not the most attractive candidate to any position out there. <laughs> Tell me about the journey at uh, at Page, because uh, you started as trainee, Correct. you just mentioned. Yeah, you ended up with the second of the Netherlands. Yeah. yeah how did you do that? Yeah, so I, um, as you know, Michael Page, huge organization, uh, about 10,000 recruitment consultants worldwide, um, different divisions, and also based on seniority, you would be placed in a certain division. I was doing the, the junior positions within supply chain and logistics. Uh, there was one uh, market in Amsterdam, which was actually based on a few passcodes, which is the Westelijk Havengebied. So the, 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 the West Harbor of Amsterdam. Well, and since we didn't have any, any real customers in that, in that region, everything has to be started from scratch. So that also resulted in after year one, where I thought I was building relationships and doing the right things, leadership was having a conversation with me like, hey, are you sure recruitment is something for you? Uh, that, yeah, that, that hurts, especially when you're you know, sitting in office, uh, eight in the morning, uh, well, making 12 hours every day and thinking that you're doing the right things, but uh, apparently leadership thinks differently. So that, that really hurt it, but that was in, I think, October or November. And then I kicked off the year in, in Jan with uh, three placements. Uh, and then, of course, you know, you're as good as your last quarter because then the tables turn and you, you start to become the hero of the team. Uh, yeah, and, and, and that that evolved pretty well up to the point where, you know, you would enjoy those, uh, those 4P lunches that we had. You make four placements, you go to a Michelin star restaurant uh, every month. Uh, and the, the, you know, the number of those lunches packed up and stacked up. And, uh, then I realized that I, uh, earned my red card. So red card was uh, the logo of, of page personnel, which was a brand of Michael page was, uh, was red. So the red card would be when you would hit, I don't know, 75% of your targets or you would at least exceed and then well, whatever number. And then afterwards was the black card and the black card was the, you know, the thing that everybody would be very proud of. <laughs> 
Yeah. yeah, and then achieved that in the in the second or third year. I don't even remember. But it also made me realize, like, okay, this is to a degree transactional. Um, I'm I'm curious to have um, a more long term impact on a business, uh, build long standing relationships with uh, maybe more senior stakeholders in the business, uh, but also handle a more complex sale. But yeah, I didn't realize back then that that was SaaS. I was just looking for more money. <laughs> <laughs> At least. A very strong motivator of you, right. apparently. Yeah. And uh, do you have, before we move to that uh, chapter of your career, uh, do you have tips for rec recruiters or aspiring recruiters? What did you do to hit all those uh, milestones within Page? Yeah. And maybe it sounds cliche, but be genuinely curious. Yeah. What helps for me is to really understand what people would do on their day-to-day -day job. Try to understand what makes somebody feel excited about the stuff that they do. Um, and by understanding what their day looks like, it becomes easier as well to understand what their ambitions may be. Mm -hmm. While doing that, you start to build a better relationship with your uh, candidates. Then at the same time, you would, do, you would have the same conversations with the potential hiring managers. True curiosity that is hard to find. Because yeah. if, uh, you mentioned that you're very money motivated. So if is, is that the reason you are very curious or are you curious by default and that leads you into these results. Yeah, so the curiosity is not played. Yeah. It's it's actually just interesting to have a, a conversation that, that doesn't stay on the on the surface, uh, but where you can really connect and, and um, just understand. I'm, I'm motivated to understand people, their personal motivations and behavior. And where does it come from, you think? That's a good question. Yeah. I actually have no idea. Yeah, but uh, um, is, it, is there anything that... Uh, if, if I ask your mom or dad, yeah. like, hey, how does Michael come so curious? And, and maybe it is related to the, to the, to the motivation to, to sell and do business. So uh, apparently when I was seven or eight years old, I always loved going to the, the Rommelmarkt, which was once every year. I'm not sure what the word is in English, but where I would sell the stuff that I wasn't using. And uh, they, I came, came home with a decent amount of money and they, they always like, wow, that's, that's interesting. So then I wonder... In order to make a good sale, you have to at least be curious to understand what somebody's motivation would be. So maybe the, the curiosity is driven by motivation to do business. But as you, some, I think behavior is something that you can teach yourself as well. So at a certain point in time, it becomes natural to you to be curious. Mm -hmm. And I also think that on top of that, it's also a natural connector. Like uh, if, if you walk in whatever bar, you would talk to everyone. Yeah. It's like, what, what is that almost gift that you have? It's always awkward and uncomfortable initially doing something for the first time, going into standing in front of a group, a group of people, an audience where you would do a presentation. I remember being super nervous when, when I was younger, uh, my face would always turn super red and, um, uh, because of, you know, the, um, Maybe insecurity, you would you would just ramble, not think anymore to a point that you might even get dizzy. I remember doing my uh, spreekbeurt about chickens when I was <laughs> eight or nine or something, how nervous I was. But that's, I think, the, the, the key thing about, and it's, again, I think cliche because you, you hear that a lot these days, but being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Yeah. That's like in every sales book out there. I yeah, guess. <laughs> so I hate saying no, it, but it yeah. is actually true. Yeah, and um, to a degree, that's a non that's a numbers game. I think uh, if we would talk about parenthood, I think all the cliches are true as well. But uh, <laughs> we talked to the point uh, that you were uh, you you wanted to jump from page to the SaaS world. Yeah, that's also when we met. Yeah, uh, yeah. I I like to have my pre screens in the bar. Usually, no, no, it was, uh, <laughs> I think that was uh, via a mutual friend and he connected us and said, Michael, second one, the page, uh, make sure that he has a, a great job in SaaS. Okay, okay uh, let, let's try. And then, uh, yeah, I think you were very, very driven to go into SaaS sales. And I think back then, um, uh, most hiring managers were quite yeah, cautious about hiring someone from a recruitment background. Very much. I think we are now to the point that recruitment is one almost a key search for people that uh, go into SDR roles or AE roles. Um, can you remember or can you share some experience how you experienced that period of your search or your life? I think it was it was difficult because uh, to your point, 
um, even though as, as a recruitment consultant, you work on the, the full deal cycle. So you're responsible for finding the candidate, building relationships with businesses, and then matching the two as well. And I mean, to have two people make decisions about, you know, joining a future, it's different than just selling a solution to somebody, a software solution, because the software is typically not going to say no. Um, but being able to, um, what I think most hiring managers don't understand when they consider hiring a recruiter for a software position is how complex it is to uh, match two human beings together. That aside, there was a struggle back then. So typically I would apply for AE positions and then they were like, well, yeah, we, we feel more comfortable getting you into an SDR role. And then a good, good friend of both of us, Rick Thomas, uh, uh, he was like, well, if he's second at, uh, uh, at Michael Page, yeah, then he can probably sell a bit of software as well. Uh, so he finally was able to, you know, step into, uh, how do you say that? Well, <laughs> you know, take a, take an educated guess and, and try it with me. Yeah. It's funny because I think we, uh, uh, we organized more than 10 interviews back then mm. for you. Uh, I think uh, every one of the hiring manager that did not pull the trigger back then uh, hates himself now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I, th I think you took um, uh, f first, your first step in SaaS sales was uh, the plot project. Yeah, if I'm not correct. Mistaken. correct. Uh, how would you describe that, uh, the period of your career? Yeah, so I had no idea. Um, so we were selling location intelligence um, based on somebody's physical location. We would track uh, and store that data, which allows retailers, for instance, to uh, enrich customer profiles, have better audiences for their personal enrichment. And then um, at the same time, uh, our app allowed for you know, sending push notifications to a user in the scenario where they would be close to a physical store. So like, hey, you know, uh, these products are currently at a discount. Would it be worth going into the store? So if you think about it, it's a very clever solution. And the omni-channel retail or omni-channel revenue growth strategy, um, we could perfectly align with that. But I remember when... Um, the, typically, when you would deal with uh, a recruitment cycle, you would talk to the hiring manager, to HR, and to the candidate. Um, at least that's what I did back in the day. I would approach it differently right now. However, what I forgot to realize that there's a there are more departments uh, responsible for making that decision in the scenario where it would go with plot projects. And I had a colleague back then, Vincent. He was like, "Well, if you're." Um, if you're now talking to the head of product, um, given this, the thing that we're selling also has an influence on marketing. It has an influence in, on technology. Uh, most likely procurement is going to be involved. Um, and, and definitely somebody from leadership because otherwise they'll never sign up on the project. Like, come on, dude. How would you know that? I mean, you don't, you don't know my relationship with, uh, with Arvind. There was specifically... Uh, uh, a business in, in India, Future Group, like the biggest retailer out there, uh, 150,000 employees. And my, I thought I could close that deal with him alone. I had zero idea. So, <laughs> yeah, I think that there was, um, uh, there was a steep, steep learning curve. So you curve. closed the business, I assume. I closed it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Close lost. <laughs> no, I closed one. Oh, closed okay. one, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think today it's still one of the biggest deals that, that Plot Project's ever closed. Uh, oh, but you closed that business? I eventually closed them. Oh, okay. Yes, I think there was six or 7,000 uh, MRR. So that was the first kind of enterprise deal that I ended yeah. up worked on, yeah. What well, what did you learn there then? You said something already about DMU or different type of people to target um, uh, from that step in recruitment uh, to a smaller SaaS company. Yeah. What uh, what were the big biggest differences and what were the biggest learning learnings? Yeah, I think the the the, the multi threading um, where back in the day the, the way I sold. It's, it's all about creating urgency and, and trying to understand uh, a business or an individual's um, long-term, maybe strategic objectives. Now, what I didn't do in recruitment is understand, okay, but where's the business heading towards? So why is it so important to ensure that um, 
these positions are filled. And what it didn't do, for instance, since Michael Page would, let's say there's a, there's a, a large logistics company. Uh, they would have finance, marketing, sales departments, logistics, et cetera. So we as a team could sell to them together um, and better align with their long-term strategy, which might be a big retention problem. If we would have um, collaborated together better at Michael Page and then at the same time um, work with the different divisions and with their leadership team, I think your proposition would, would be entirely different. Uh, but I never realized how that would work. And you were a trainee, I guess. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When so you started that, there. Yeah. <laughs> You worked uh, for a little while at uh, Plot Project. Yeah. And there was a point that you were looking again. What, uh, what happened? Think total addressable market. So the, um, what you saw is that we required uh, the individual user, so the consumer, to opt in for sharing location. You might remember, I think it was five, four or five years ago, where Apple and Google started to roll out these notifications. Like, hey, this app is tracking your location in the background. That's when... The total addressable market of the business uh, have, well, significantly decreased. Um, uh, I shifted the focus to India um, because they were more open to sharing location if you would get something in return. Uh, less privacy sensitive uh, compared to y Europe and the US. Now with, with India changing to a degree there as well, uh, the, and we had to go through a couple of reorganizations. For me, it was a point like, well, there's a balance between loyalty and um, making a decision on what's the best for yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's when I reached out to you again. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what were you looking for back then? Yeah. So I, I enjoyed the, the startup vibe, uh, being able to make a massive impact. Um, so that, that got me excited. Then I wanted to sell something complex. Um, I didn't know why, but just something that has a, a large impact on an organization. Um, uh, what I learned from working at a, at a pre-seed startup or well, a seed startup is that VC funding will definitely help in, in driving your strategy forward, uh, even when you don't make the necessary uh, revenue yet. Um, however, what I wanted is a, is a bit of a more mature company, ideally with, and I remember uh, telling this to you, like, well, ideally a U well, a US-based company with uh, wealth VC funded by well-known VCs, as well as a relatively small team, but also uh, already with a relatively you know strong name and at least you know ten or twenty million ARR. That was that was a bit of the bit of the goal. Um, that I expressed to you back in the day. And, and, and for uh, people that are looking for a new, uh, yeah, new role in SaaS, what what does the VC funding uh, say to you, or what did it tell you back then? <laughs> yeah, I mean, we <laughs> we've all seen the the bubble where, based on a good idea, people would or businesses would invest tens of millions. But you know, if you just um, if if you think about the, the the concept of funding, is that people trust in your business, you might already have product market fit, and the product market fit you can or the maturity of the business you can assess based on the series that they're in. Mm -hmm. um, so you might expect something different from a series A compared to a series D. So when you're considering moving into software, um, I probably would recommend the, the more junior people to start at maybe series C or up, because that's probably where you would get more support um, in your development. Whereas at a smaller startup, you typically see that Product market fit is not discovered completely yet. The ideal customer profile still has to be determined. Um, there's not a, a lot of customers maybe yet where you can learn from. So that's more discovery, experimentation, evangelizing a certain proposition, um, maybe being first in the market where people don't believe it yet. Whereas if you're going to sell Salesforce, like, yeah, of course you need the CRM. We're, we're not going to build it, build it ourselves. And that's, of course... The other side of the spectrum. Yeah. I think also this question for uh, hiring managers, uh, you were like their top biller uh, there. You already told us that uh, you learned a lot from it. Absolutely. How could you n not make that uh, uh, choice? Like, w would you join a smaller startup again in, the, uh, in your life or in your career? Yeah, I'm, uh, hypothetically, but then then through network. So I, I wouldn't go blindly into a new position where, you know, a recruiter approaches me that I don't know. 
um, where I don't know the, the VCs behind it or um, I'm not connected to a degree with, with the current leadership team um, or nobody that I trust is connected with that leadership team. Yeah, okay. Because every business can be so different and it's hard to assess based on a website only. Yeah. So what I would be looking for then is, you know, like-minded people that are experts in a certain vertical or are, um, well, very aware about a problem that is existing in the market that maybe I'm not aware of yet, but they are the experts where you would, you know, trust their idea and like, well, let's, let's do this. I trust that uh, this could be something big. Let's go to market. And that that's something that gets me really excited, and that's um, also what excites me at Chartview because we make acquisitions of companies, we uh, heavily invest in innovations. Every time there there's something new, and it's like, oh, nice. Yeah. This doesn't exist yet. Uh, I'm super excited to test how this lands with you know the the people that we try to sell it to, and then start to get those first kind of results. Um, and and used it as you know both internal storytelling to inspire others, but as well uh, get similar companies excited about you know making that part of of the transformation. So that's that that's I think the the the, the entrepreneurial kind of mindset where um, I I don't want to create something brand new, but I, I'd like to trust others that they build a great software solution that I couldn't even have thought of that I'm inspired about and like well then. I would love, you know, partnering with you to uh, help you go to market and um, be successful. Yeah, that's 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 cool uh, to hear your thoughts on that. That's uh, yeah. And uh, I think today everyone knows Chargebee in yeah. the in the SaaS uh, ecosystem. Um, when you started at Chargebee, I think no one knew them. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Can you tell us more about that journey, like uh, about how it was seen in the market, your first grind in Chargebee? I want yeah. to hear everything about that. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, you, you join a company with big expectations. Uh, I, I flew into to India for, and it was January 2019, well, four years ago, or 2020, Jan 2020. Flew to India because we're, we're Indian founded. Um, immediately got in touch with an amazing culture. Uh, we as Europeans or maybe even Dutch people might be, well, less... Uh, open to new joiners and and being kind of well let let him or her prove himself first and then we'll have a nice conversation well it's in india completely opposite so that was that was a great experience um went through the onboarding spent there three, three or four weeks and then then came back in the netherlands and there was no one so i was the first guy uh which was which was interesting um and where i started was like well okay this is something completely new Let's see who in my network has something to do with finance because Chartree is a revenue infrastructure and we uh, help businesses with uh, automation of, you know, billing, revenue recognition, online payments, uh, enable product-led growth and sales-led growth uh, with the goals, of course, to, I know, drive audit readiness, prepare for M&A, be attractive to VCs or, or maybe Exeter IPO is, is something that they're planning and we can contribute to that. Um, but back in the day, my idea was, okay, we, we sell billing automation and that's, that's also what we did. Uh, we helped startups or maybe scale-ups with, uh, connecting the dots, ensuring that all the data would be in one ecosystem. So primarily finance data, help them move out of Excel, uh, automate complex, uh, pricing models like tiered or usage based. Um, and what I did was, well. Let's practice at least a pitch. At least I'm trying to see if this resonates with anyone. So I, I called the people in my networks so like, hey, join this new business. Um, I've, I'm not trying to sell it to you. I'm just trying to explain what we do. Can you please help me understand how that would hypothetically resonate in your organization? Is there anything that, that you get excited about? Because I don't understand what the problems are in this industry. Just trying to sell software, but I don't know why. Um, and that, that, that resonated well. So that helped me with, um, well, getting up to speed pretty fast. Um, that's of course, when we, when we hired Tarmo as well, uh, tens of years in, in, in financial technology who could help me understand like, well, yeah, Michael, I understand 
you know, there's there's other players in the market and they might be a bit more mature. Um, I've either worked for them or uh, I competed against them. However, the reason why I joined Charge is because our, our, your, our product is way stronger. So that's positioned as well. So he helped me a lot with those competitive pitches, which is primarily against Recurly and, and Chargeify. And we would we would win tons. And that's when I started to realize, okay, this is this is heading in in, in the right direction. Yeah, f- f- fast forward because we uh, we heard that you uh, your first salary in recruitment was twenty two hundred per month. Uh, like, what kind of ballpark do we need to think of if if someone is aspiring global top builder at a SaaS company? Yeah, so at, at Chart we have been um, uh, typically always in in top three, um, uh, two years number one globally. Um, yeah, in in terms of salary, you, you can think of hundreds of thousands of, of euros every every year when you sell over over a million or a million and a half for the business, um, and that's not just chart graphing. That that's very common for businesses that sell enterprise solutions to organizations. Um, uh, then the the sky is the limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's cool to hear that. And how how someone that would start now in um, in the software world, what are your learnings? Like, wh- what is the journey from uh, new to SaaS sales to become global top t- uh, biller? I want to hear your learnings, but maybe also tips uh, what you can share for people that are maybe earlier in their journey. Yeah. So nobody gives a shit about the product that you sell. Nobody does. So... When, when you're trying to push a product to an organization, even when they knocked on your door for help, it doesn't necessarily mean that they will buy your software. Um, you might be uh, talking with the wrong stakeholder. Maybe somebody is just curious to understand what's out there and there's not even a project. Uh, and then you're at a point where it's like, okay, I think we are now at a technical win. Uh, let's start discussing commercials. And they'll always say like, yeah, yeah, yeah share, share, the, share the pricing uh, proposal with us because they're just curious. And how do you overcome that then? So overcoming that is to 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 what I mentioned mm-hmm. at the start. It's 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 understanding the strategic objectives of the business. So uh, let's say it's an organization that uh, had multiple acquisitions. They did multiple acquisitions. We could assume that every individual entity or organization that they acquired have their own ecosystem. They've got their own. Uh, billing system, ERP, CRM, they might use spreadsheets, then they acquire another business. And typically what happens after acquisition is consolidation, both to uh, impact customer experience, but more over operational efficiency, which uh, eventually the goal is to be auditable. So uh, when big when the big four knocks on your door every year, you have to make sure that uh, the data that you show is correct. So I've built this customer, uh, can you prove that you also gave the service to the customer? You have had multiple iterations throughout the billing cycle and they have to translate in things like revenue accounting. Now, I'm going into a lot of detail here, but that helps us understand why businesses need to change. Like, okay, you acquired multiple organizations. It's a shit show when it comes to data. However, you're preparing for IPO. Yeah. So that's the critical event that we're working towards. Which if you, and that was, I think in the first two years of Chargepy, I was like, well, I'm looking at the individual entity and I see that they have two or three FTEs uh, operationally or manually managing invoicing operations. Well, three people, uh, expected salaries, about 70K, cost of labor, 210K return on investment. Nice. You know, my... My deal is maybe 30 or 40K, so that's a 500X improvement or 500% improvement of what they have today. And then I was like, well, there is clear ROI. Why are you you not buying? I don't understand it. But what I maybe forgot, I was talking to this one entity and I might have a competitor or another consulting firm. It's like, well, I'm going to talk to the parent company um, because they will top down initiate all the changes. And I, I might be stuck here with this financial controller that wants to automate some of his work. So what it taught me is go straight to top. You said something interesting there because uh, 
uh, when I asked you the question, like, hey, what were like pivotal moments in your career? You uh, you were two years in at Charge B and you basically said, hey, I'm losing deals still. Yeah. You were a global top biller and you still felt you did not have control. Exactly. So you wrote a book. What is that for the listeners again? Omega Deal Secrets. Okay. Jamal Reimer. Okay. Cool. Um, and that taught me the executive alignment. Mm-hmm. And executives tell you more about their future than somebody who's a director. Director might not even be aware. Executives as is on the line, if it doesn't succeed, they probably are facing the same challenges and feel more comfortable sharing experience from CFO to CFO, from CEO to CEO, because they're facing the same problems. And what other drivers do we have to be successful? Because we talked about money. I think we laughed about it a little bit. Uh, I think if we dive deeper, you have way other things that drive you. Uh, (laughs) What are those? Yeah, so I, th- I think it's it's um, uh, together with my wife, Robina, that we can enjoy life. And that's where it started with, of course, just that we that we have the, the, the flexibility to, well, make decisions and enjoy ourselves. And, and whether that's a, a nice holiday in the Caribbean, um, but also make sure that we uh, save the right amount of money in order to buy our dream house and be comfortable, marry a wife or a husband that's very strong and <laughs> and and can serve as your 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 foundation that keeps you honest. Um, it's 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 definitely that. I mean, Robina gives me tons of flexibility. She supports me. She's a, a neuropsychologist, so she can help me as well understand my own behavior a little bit better. But at the same time, the the grind. Um, to be honest, is also required. But the grind is not so much in activity. Um, like, ah, oh, I've got I've got eight discovery calls today, or I have four demos that I'm preparing for today. Just fo- try to focus on the real deals and, and go deep. And don't be afraid to spend time researching, thinking, going over that email a million times, um, go spend shit tons of time on business cases, mm-hmm. especially when you're doing strategic deals, but also when you're selling smaller deals. Overinvest in the uh, in the opportunities that most likely will give you the biggest returns. And how do you know that if you're like somewhat just a few years experience? I think you 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 should learn from the people that are more senior in your business. Mm-hmm. So don't be afraid to ask for help. Um, what I see a lot is, is people reaching out on Slack and asking questions. I'm a, I'm a firm, well, <laughs> believer of spending FaceTime with, with colleagues or like-minded people where you can, you can share experiences, share frustrations, share wins. When you're face-to-face, good luck saying no. Yeah. yeah. So if we're talking about asking for help, and reaching out on Slack or WhatsApp or whatsoever, it's super easy for people to focus on their bigger priorities, the in-person priorities, that little conversation. Maybe it's even playing ping pong or having a bit of foosball or going for a walk with a colleague, uh, even though your your personal problem might be bigger than that fun stuff that we're doing there. Uh, but if you're in office or if you're face-to-face, and it doesn't have to be every day, ask that question, just interrupt somebody in, in his work or her work and they would be open to like, yeah, let's sit down five minutes, I'll help you out. Y- you gotta be patient and, and go through a bit of a roller coaster because it's, it's not always super cliche again, you know, it's not always straight, um, growth is not linear, Let, let's put it that way. It helps think that every time you're like, ah, oh, this is the, the deepest part, you'll get over it. Yeah. That there will be something if you just push through and continue, try to stay positive, stay motivated, and then eventually everything will will come to an end, and then there will be a new problem. Yeah. So I think it 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 um what I specifically to your point, but what, what was for instance um, uh, less positive is I worked last year on a deal for for over a year. Um, outbound source, everything went perfect. We went to Berlin multiple times. I flew in people from India, from the US to present to their executive team. We had multi-day workshops. Everything was heading in the right direction. And then, you know, silence. You knew when this was. I mean, we had my bachelor party. Uh, That was this year where we we were close to getting, well, a Hail Mary deal signed. 
uh, which didn't push through. Um, and and yeah, I don't know, man. I, I was uh, I was so frustrated. It felt like when well, I was frustrated, I was very sad. It felt like if your loved one said like, "No, we're 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 ending this relationship. Let's enjoy what we're doing here." Let's focus less on the numbers, which is incredibly difficult. Mm -hmm. But let's just focus on the, the most ICP customers out there that have the, the most ideal business scenario that requires change. There's a critical event that we're aware of. Let's, let's dive deep, build business cases, learn, adapt, have fun. And then the, the numbers will come later. But then I, I think the, 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 the critical thing is don't make decisions when you're super happy. Don't make decisions when you're super sad. I think that's a very good one. That's a very good one. Be loyal. And and then things will come on your path. Um, whether that's maybe a change in position or hypothetically, um, you know, a, a promotion or, or deeper work or whatever. It it works the best with people that trust you if you wanna if you wanna grow. Don't you ever get tempted like that? Every, to 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 check every, everyone around you. Like I sometimes have the, if I if I'm not balanced, I think the grass is always greener. Oh, I want to have more success here, or hey, this person has better than me, or whatsoever. Do, are you ever tempted looking outside instead of inside? <laughs> Standard. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's if you're, and I think that that's also part why you're so motivated to keep on changing and challenging yourself to do things differently. Um, that's also because you see success of others, but that, that might not be a jealousy thing or, or an envy kind of, kind of thing, but rather, you know, there are two ways to look at it. So you could be jealous or you could be inspired. Yeah. Uh, and I think there's a very thin line between the two, uh, or thin, thin balance, whatever the expression is. Um, I think jealousy was, was something that I, I experienced a lot back in the day and, it helps when when you've been top performer for a while, and then uh, if other close larger deals, it's like, oh, nice, you know. I can first you're like, oh, this hurts, but then it's like, okay, great, this is perfect because uh, apparently we can sell even larger deals, yeah. and this may be a bigger organization. Let's have a conversation, share experiences, and yeah, use it as a motivation that you're not only that one person that, for instance, closes the largest deals and be uninspired. Yeah. It's, it's, it's good when people around you buy bigger houses, close larger deals, drive whatever cars, or are on holidays 10 weeks per year uh, and, and blowing it out of the water. Yeah. That, that should be inspiration, right? Yeah. So it also sounds that you, uh, you're, you have been on a journey from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset in that sense. Yeah, I never never thought about it like that, but um, or maybe not actively, but yeah, it it just doesn't work when you're when when you feel envy or when you hate that somebody else has success. Uh, it impacts the way you do business as well. Um, so yeah, in order to overcome that, you have to change it. Hey, uh, Michael, uh, thanks a lot. I think this is a great story of someone who successfully built his career uh, in SaaS. Uh, do you have any other tips for people that are listening that maybe want uh, yeah, get inspired by our journey? Yeah. Well, of course, have a conversation with Noble Recruitment. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> they <laughs> help me start. with my dream job. <laughs> 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 no, it's uh, have, have a lot of conversations um, and try to have a broad mindset. Um, don't underestimate the network that you have and um, especially talk with, with people that are more, you know, mature in their career then maybe you are yourself. Um, try to understand their, you know, learnings and failures on, on the one side to make sure that you're personally um, performing well, just as, as a human being. But then on the other side, don't just focus on, on, don't forget that when you pick a job, that's going to be your, well, something that you spent whatever percentage of your time. So look broad and try to understand the bigger picture before you sign something up, uh, sign up with something. Yeah, thanks a lot for all these, uh, yeah, inspiring uh, learnings, uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, I think we can talk for hours. Uh, like we usually do. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I, I've seen you also grow personally, like as in, uh, yeah, you up-leveled your 
life almost with uh, your success in SaaS. I've I've been on your wedding in Italy. There was like almost a castle where all your friends came and all your uh, family. So it's also nice to yeah uh, make that happen for yourself and for your family. And uh, yeah, besides a great career, you're also bi- uh, building a great uh, family and uh, building a great human in yourself. So uh, very, uh, very happy to uh, be in your network as well. <laughs> very, very appreciate that. And let's, uh, yeah, I think we can, we can consider ourselves good friends. <laughs> <laughs> so th- thanks so much for you know allowing me to work at Chartree because you you sold me well. Thanks for joining us on SaaS Unscripted. To explore the latest career opportunities, visit our website, noblerecruitment.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave your review on your favorite podcast app. Until next time on SaaS Unscripted.